Are you feeling a little fuzzy on Docker terminology like layers and images and containers? If so, this is the episode for you. I'm going to go over some Docker basics and then I'm going to demo Docker by running an ASP.NET boilerplate application locally using Docker Compose files. Hey, and welcome to episode 26 of Code Hour. Over the next few episodes, I am going to go over how to deploy an ASP.NET boilerplate app. And I'm going to show eventually how to get it into Kubernetes. I'm interested in doing this because my application that I'm working on professionally right now is in Kubernetes and I've learned a whole bunch of things. I've got a whole bunch of lessons learned, things not to do, and I'd love to convey that to you so that you can avoid making my mistakes. Now, before we can even get into the bigger deployment picture of deploying to Kubernetes, we need to be able to run it locally and we need to be able to uh, understand what all of these different terms are. And so that's what I was going to go over right now. Okay, so I've got four areas. I'm going to go three areas. I'm going to go over what Docker is. I'm going to go over some of the benefits and then some of the terminology. So, first of all, what is it? Right on Docker's website, they have this definition. I kind of like it. It's a platform for developers and sysadmins to develop, ship, and run applications. I like that. It's nice and high level. We're basically saying Docker is about deploying code. Awesome. It uses operating system level virtualization to deliver software in packages called containers. I'm going to get into what containers are in a little bit, but you hear this word virtualization, operating system level virtualization. And so already you kind of think maybe, well, this sounds like uh, virtual machines. I, I know virtual machines. I know what that is. Um, and Docker really is a an alternative to virtualization. And so I found this image also on the website. I like this because it compares three applications running in VMs to the three same three applications running in Docker. And you'll see here there's a physical server, obviously, which is what everything runs on. The hypervisor is what provides the virtualization, the virtual machines, and allows them to be able to run. And then there's a separate operating system for each one of those applications. That means that we have the resources, we have to pre-allocate the resources for three separate operating systems all of the hard drive space duplicated three separate times and all of the memory and disk usage allocated three separate times and that's expensive. Alternatively with Docker we're going to have the infrastructure and the operating system but then we're going to have the Docker engine instead of the hypervisor and each one of those operating systems is not duplicated. Instead we just have the application and the file system running on top of the Docker engine. Each one of the applications feels like it's running in a VM. It doesn't know the difference, but looking at it from the host's perspective, it's not actually running in a VM and it's considerably more lightweight than a traditional virtual machine. So you might be wondering, well, you know, what if I want to want to run a one in want to want to run in? What if I want to run in Windows? Well, there since Windows Server 2016, you can run Windows containers. I don't tend to do this because it is uh, not as mature of a platform and there's a lot of things that just don't really work quite as well um, and, and in some cases things actually cost more because you have to pay for the Windows license depending on how you're deploying. So things work a little bit better if you stay in Linux and that's what I'm going to do for this presentation and the subsequent deployment presentations. One note, though, is if you do want to run Windows images, the, the, you, you generally have to run those on a Windows server. There is something new that Microsoft has released called Linux Containers on Windows, LCOW, and you can look that up if it interests you. It is basically provides you the ability to run natively Windows and Linux images on the same Docker instance without the need to have a separate virtualization layer. But normally uh, you're better off just running everything in Linux or everything in Windows and I'm going to be running everything in Linux. 
So to get started, you need to run install Docker Desktop. I'm going to be doing most of my work on Windows here, but you could probably follow along very similarly on Mac. Wouldn't be that big of a deal. And you, once you install it, then you're going to get this little thing in the tray here, the Docker icon. And if you install Kubernetes support, then that's going to be there. And I'll be getting to that in a subsequent episode. Okay, so that's the, the very, very high level of, of what it is. In terms of the benefits, I've already talked a little bit about this. Compared to virtual machines, you still get app isolation. Each app doesn't know about any other app. Um, and both of them are trying to solve this, but it works on my machine problem, uh, which has been uh, the bane of most developers that have ever gone to production because, hey, it always works on my machine, and then once it gets to production, something doesn't work. Right. Both virtualization is supposed to solve that and Docker. Um, so if you can get it to work in Docker, it's probably going to work in production, which is awesome. Uh, however, if you're going Docker versus virtual virtualization, you get these really nice benefits. It boots up super fast. Uh, it's just it's so much faster than traditional VMs. Um, also, each one of these Docker containers is disposable. You're supposed to consider it to be like cattle not like pets. So it's not something you go in and you fiddle with and maybe make some changes to it. You're supposed to completely destroy it if anything goes wrong. You patch it and recreate a new one. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Minimal memory usage, minimal disk space usage, those are all wonderful benefits of using Docker versus virtual machines. How about using an app service? What's wrong with, oh, I don't know, right click and deploying and sending it up to an Azure app service? Well. That's actually a great way to do things. But if you choose to go Docker, you get some benefits. One, vendor neutrality. It's going to be considerably easier if you want to take those Docker containers or that Docker container and send it over and switch to deploying it over to Amazon. Um, similarly, it is portable across servers. If you want to run it locally or run it on your local servers, it will. you know that it's going to be able to run in all of those different environments, and that portability can be really handy. Also, app services have this sandbox where because app services are running in a shared environment with other tenants, basically, there are certain things you can't do, like accessing the registry and stuff like that. Well, you can do things like that. Registry isn't a great example, but you can do things like that that in a Docker image that you're not going to be able to do in a sandbox environment. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility. Finally, if you are interested in a microservices type of architecture and using Kubernetes and you're interested in getting the scalability and the reliability and all the benefits that come with that, then getting Docker is going to be the way that you need to go. However, be aware that if you're going down this Kubernetes path, it is far more complicated. So just be aware of what you're getting into. It, it is a lot more powerful, but a lot more complicated for it. All right, let's talk terminology. When I joined my first professional job in 1999, a long time ago, my first employer was a management consulting company and they taught me that the first thing you do when you go into a client is you start trying to understand what the requirements are and you build out these diagrams because making a visual representation of what a customer's business is is something that you can work with them and non-technical people can can work with you and you can work with them with this shared language one of them is process diagrams which don't really apply too much here but the other one is entity relationship diagrams and I love these things and I have a blog post about how to read them, but I'm just going to go through it here and hopefully it'll make sense. So think of it like a database. So hopefully you're ready to dive on in. The key part of this that is the most important is images and containers. Now you can think of an image like a class and a container like a class instance. The container is what is actually running on a machine. The image is like the instructions for how it should run. It's a template that can be multiple containers can be created from that one image. Now if you do that and you stamp out multiple containers from an image, 
Well, you're going to have some problems. For instance, what if they're all wanting to be a web server and listen on port 80? Well, you can't have multiple listeners on port 80. And so that's where these port mappings come in. Port mappings say, when I instantiate a container, I want 80 to actually be 8081. And I want 80 for this second one to be 8082. And that way you can have multiple containers that are all instantiated from the same image. Similarly, you're expecting these containers to be thrown away. Again, they're like cattle, not like pets. So any data that's ever written to them should be considered temporary in nature. If you need data to last for the long time, then you've got volumes. And you can attach volumes such as Azure storage drives, and then those can be long lasting, but by default, you don't get that. So I just I wanted to put that diagram, that element of the diagram in here to emphasize the fact that containers should really not be considered permanent storage for writing things to unless you're writing that in the Docker file. Docker file. Okay, which brings us to the Docker file. So the Docker file is like the instructions for how the image should be created. It's a file that's called dot docker file and in it are the instructions for how to create that image step one is to specify a parent image you almost always specify a parent image which then well i guess it's pretty much it's pretty much required you're going to have to specify a parent image and it's it's usually going to it might have another parent image so there's this whole hierarchy of um, parent to parent to child, you can have multiple children, but when you're writing a Docker file, you only specify one and only one parent image. And sometimes that's just the primary Linux container, Ubuntu, for instance, that you're interested in inheriting from, or sometimes it's a little bit lower on the stack, like maybe I want to run the ASP.NET Core, which is based on the, an Ubuntu image, or maybe I want to run something that somebody, third, some third party person published, which I can inherit from, basically. Docker files have layers, and each instruction that goes into, this is going to make a little more sense later, but each instruction that goes into a Docker file represents a new separate layer, and each one of these layers is going to be cached locally, and so that's where, and they can be shared across multiple images, and that's where all of your performance benefit comes from. Okay. Last thing is, well, last two things. One, images can have tags. So you might want to say, this is the version 2.1, this is the version 2.2. That becomes very important later. And then similarly, uh, you can publish up to a registry. There's one main registry that everybody uses, which is the, the public registry, which is Docker Hub. And that is the default. Usually don't even specify it in commands. And then that registry can have multiple repositories, such as Microsoft is a repository. And then that repository can have images that were published to it, which are closer to tags. But tags, images, those are what live inside of repositories. Whew. OK, hopefully that is enough just to give you a, a, a brief uh, overview of the terminology. Let's dig in and get into some code. First of all, a Docker file. This is a Docker file, and I am running this Docker file from inside of the Lee's Store application that I've been demoing in previous episodes, and specifically in episode 19, I believe. Yeah. Be a Hero on Day One with ASP.NET Boilerplate. That is the episode where I overviewed. ASP.NET Boilerplate, and I've been building it up with a couple other episodes since then. So I'm going to take that application and try to publish it locally in Docker. In episode 19, I was just running it live from in Visual Studio, but now I'm going to be doing it differently. I'm going to run it through a Docker Compose file, and a Docker Compose file takes multiple Docker files and spits them up together and allows them to share uh, ports and, and inter interact with them with each other a little bit. So these Docker files, this one lives inside of the web host project. Well, let's just back up to the very top. So there's the ASP.NET Core in the root, and then there's source, and then there's Lee Store web host. And this Docker file says, I am going to inherit from, remember I said you could, 
these Docker files kind of inherit from somewhere. I'm going to inherit from Microsoft slash ASP.NET Core 2.0.2. .2. Well, we can look this up and see if this really makes sense for the type of thing that we want to inherit from. So I'm going to go to Docker Hub and I'm going to search for this repository. And here it is, this says that this is deprecated. We should no longer be using this. Instead, we should be using, here we are, mcr.microsoft.com slash .net slash core slash ASP.NET, and then the tag there. So let's, first of all, before we get too far down this path of using the wrong root, we want that to be .NET Core ASP.NET and the version. I think if we look in the CS Proj here, we're going to see that this runs .NET Core 2.2. .2. I'm using an older version of ASP.NET boilerplate, and so if you're using a more recent version, obviously update that. But I think if we do go to 2.2, .2, that is right. Yes, 2.2. .2, that is likely to work the way we were expecting. The next command is, it says this is the root directory that we want to uh, do stuff from, and then this is going to take all of the files in a build directory, which are going to be DLLs, and it's going to plunk those into that working directory, that app directory. And then it is going to start for its default command, the thing that it does when you start the Docker image. It's going to run .NET, on that DLL as, as the parameter. So it's a very simple Docker file, great for getting started. Let's see if we can make this thing run. And, and in fact, actually, before we even do that, maybe we should try just seeing if, we, if this is the right, if this is the right thing that we want to do. So let's try Docker pull image and that. No docker pull image. I think it used to be the case it was docker pull image. Now it's just docker pull, and then that is the repository and the tag. Okay, and this says this is pulling from there. Now the first thing it does when you do a docker pull to pull down an image is it goes and gets a manifest file of all of the different layers. Now this says this is a layer that it was going to pull down, and because I've done this previously, this layer is already up to date. So, hey, that's cool. Um, so we were able to pull it successfully. That's good news. Now if I docker, I can um, try to just create a new container from that image by running a command on it. So I can try doing docker run minus interactive, uh, interactive and TTY, yeah, minus IT. So I'm going to do Docker. Well, first of all, if I say Docker images, I should be able to see that. There it is. That is the image I am interested in right now. MCRMicrosoft.com.net ASP.NET Core. All right, perfect. So I want to Docker run minus IT that image uh, 2.2. .2 and I'm going to run bash on it. All right, there we go. Hey, and that's cool. We it, it actually created a new container from the image and it ran bash on it. And now I'm in here and I can ls and I can see that I am probably in a oh, an app folder. There is no app folder. All right, we're going to be creating that as part of our docker file but it doesn't yet exist. But we would expect .NET to exist, right? So if I can do .NET minus minus help, yep, that works. If I do .NET minus minus info, you'll see that we don't have any .NET Core SDKs installed, and that's because this Docker container shouldn't actually be doing any compilation. It should just be running things. We want it to be as lightweight as possible. So no .NET Core SDK. But the runtimes are installed. We have an ASP.NET 2.2.8, and we have the Microsoft.NET Core itself 2.2.8. So that's great. When I exit that, and I ask for 
all of the containers. You're going to see that I don't have a container. That's because I started it up and it immediately shut it back down. But if I docker ps minus a, you can see that that actually did once exist there, and I can docker rm to get rid of it, and docker ps minus a, and you'll see that all I have is this application from a different world. Okay, great. Let's try to run this Docker file. In order to do this, we need, well, there's a couple things we need to do. One, we need to actually build the application. And conveniently enough, ASP.NET Boilerplate provides a file which will do that for us. And it does that inside of the build folder in the host. Actually, in the, yeah, it should be in ASP.NET Core slash build. Here it is, build with ng. So I could just run this, but it's uh, there's, it's not perfect, and so we're going to have to fiddle with it just a little bit to get it to work. Let's try it. So I'm going to cd to, oh, I'm already actually there. Yeah, I'm in ASP.NET Core build, which is a, requi a prerequisite before you run that build with ng. So I'm just going to go through and hit these one by one. So it's setting up some, in oops, OK. So it's setting up some environment variables. I'm just hitting F8, by the way. OK, we've created all these folders. We're going to remove the output folder, which is outputs. It doesn't exist. It shouldn't really be a problem. And then we're going to create an output folder. There it is, outputs. Good stuff. Then we're going to change to the solution directory. We're going to do a .NET restore. That technically shouldn't be necessary. We shouldn't need to do a .NET restore because the .NET publish is going to do a .NET restore for us by default when it runs. Go into the web host and we're running a .NET publish with an output of saying, hey, go to the output folder slash host. So as this runs, we would expect OK, here we go. It ran successfully. It gave us an output slash host, gives a runtime and a dub dub rub root and a bunch of DLLs. We'll need that because that is what the Docker file is going to use. Awesome. So next, we are ready to install the Angular app. There we go. Change over to the Angular folder. Notice this is using Yarn. I've used NPM in the past. NPM, Yarn, 601, half dozen, another. This file, if I were owning this project, I would probably switch it out and instead use npm, but I happen to have yarn installed and I'll just run it as is. Uh, that normally takes a really long time. I've run this previously, so it didn't take too long. That's good. So now we're going to build the application. This always takes a while. So fortunately, I'm going to speed up time. Whew, that took a long time. Fortunately, you don't have to wait for that. But uh, one little thing I want to point out here is when I do an ng build minus minus prod, I usually like to do minus 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 aot. And one of the things that gets you is it does additional checks that happen at compile time to make sure there aren't compiler errors. And those are the kinds of things that kind of sneak in and create bugs. So I would recommend you add minus minus aot. I'm not going to bother with that right now, but just a little uh, lesson learned that I can share with you. So. In case you're not familiar, building Angular with minus minus uh, prod, ng-build, is going to put that all into a dist folder. So we're going to take that whole dist folder and move it into our output folder. OK, so now we've got a build folder here. And we also have an ng folder. And that's got all the results of our Angular build. And also, hey, we're going to take that Docker file. And I haven't shown you that Docker file. But that is a Docker file which is in the Angular. Let's take a look at it real quick right now. And this one's in, this Docker file is inheriting from a different base object. This is inheriting from Nginx, which is a super fast web server that exists in Linux, and it's going to basically take all of the contents that are in dot and share it into the user share nginx HTML folder, which is where nginx expects to find its content. Another really simple Docker file. We like that. That's good. Finally, the appconfig.json is a file which in Angular provides a lot of um, 
configuration information like hey what is my name and what is my port and what is the what is the name of the port and app that I'm going to connect back to to get to the database that's going to go through all of the APIs and I'm going to tell you right now that I think there's a bug in here but I'm going to just run it for now and let's see what happens when it runs so I'm going to run that I'm going to run that I'm going to run that and those two last command combine uh, commands here are replacing this port with this port we're expecting it to run on. So when we're running this we're probably going to see 9901 and 9902 be the ports that are exposed in Docker. Okay. So next we're going to change over to the host folder. We're going to make sure that we don't have any images named ABP host. Then we're going to build that ABP host. So Docker build is taking the, a Docker file and building an image from it. And so once we're done with this, we should have an, an, a Docker image with a tag called ABP host. So Docker images, and we should see at the top of the list here, ABP host, which was built just 11 seconds ago. Excellent. We're probably going to do the same thing now for the Angular app. So switch over to the ng folder, remove any images, and rebuild. OK, now, last thing is we want to run Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a way of, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's a, it's a way of taking multiple Docker images and running them up together. It's spinning them up at the same time, and then when you spin them up, then you need to uh, maybe expose certain ports and do certain things with them, maybe set environment variables. So we're going to copy the one that was, we're going to copy what was in Docker Angular start out start of the output folder. Okay, and so here we are inside of the outputs folder, and so we were we just grabbed the Docker Compose and the up and the down folders, up.ps1 and down.ps1, and those are the commands which are going to instantiate the Docker Compose. And I think we're going to see some errors right off the bat, but will hopefully be a good learning experience to see what to do and what not to do. So first of all, shall we cat up.ps1? All right, all it's doing is calling docker compose up minus d. Okay, well, first of all, it looks like we have an error, and this is inside of the uh, ASP. Not, well, first of all, the ABP NG one did succeed. Let's see if we can just hit that one at least. Hey, look at that. It actually retrieved an icon and it retrieved a an Angular app. It, it failed to connect back to the host because the host isn't running, but so this part of it worked. That's good news so far. But this part of it failed and the error that it gave us here was cannot start service error while creating a mount source path host mount C dev least store creating. What is all that? Well, that is because inside of ASP.NET Boilerplate, they mounted a volume, and they mounted the volume to the mounted the, the volume which inside of the Docker container is called Host Labs, and they mounted it to app. Sorry, they mounted uh, slash app slash data slash logs to this directory called Host Logs here, which doesn't even exist yet. Um, we could just delete this and not worry about mounting the volume. Um, I guess they did it because when there are errors, it's awfully convenient to be able to go to your host folder and see what the logs were. Um, so maybe let's go with it. In order to make that work, though, we have to go into Docker, Settings, and Shared Drives, and turn this on. All right, so uh, I did that. I basically went in here and reset the uh, 
the shared drives and exposed out my C drive so that it can write, so the Docker is allowed to write out to my C drive so it can get to this host logs folder. And now I have a folder here called host logs and I can run in here and see, yay, it actually seems to have uh, started up. That's great. So let's try to connect up to localhost 9901. Hmm, nothing. What if we ask for Docker PS? Looks like we do have an ABP host folder. And if I want to go inside of that and see what's going on, then I can Docker PS, and I, I highly recommend you get really comfortable with going into Docker images because this is something you're going to do all the time when things go wrong. So to do that, you Docker exec minus IT and then the name of the image, which in this case, you can just do 319, 319. You don't have to do the full hash code there. And then you can do bash. So I want to execute the bash command in an interactive TTY. And now I'm inside of the Docker, the running Docker container, which is nice. And so I can ls, and I can see that there is an app settings folder app data and logs and I can tail logs.txt and see that something is not going right I about guarantee you I know what it is so let's see I think I can well let's just cap the whole logs.txt okay the problem was in the background manager that there was an invalid operation exception timeout expired trying to get a database connection from the pool this may have occurred because well whatever the problem was couldn't connect to the database well there is actually one way to solve this which is to change the connection string and in order to change the connection string, we need to update this docker-compose.yaml file. It's really tempting to change it, the one that's here in the outputs directory. I would encourage you not to do this because this is a temporary one, right? The one in the outputs directory is going to get deleted the next time we run that command. So, well, I shouldn't, but I'm just gonna go ahead and make the changes here. To do that, notice this environment section inside of the Docker Compose file. This is allowing us to have certain environment variables. And what we need to do is to update this to specify that there is a new environment variable called, well, I forget, it's uh, app settings.json. If we go into app settings.json of the web host, you can, if there's an environment variable that ever exists with a name, mm, anything at a root level, underscore, underscore, anything at a parent level, then it will override that with ASP.NET boilerplate by default. So if I have an environment variable called, in this case, connection strings, underscore, underscore, default, then that environment variable, then ASP.NET boilerplate will, and ASP.NET will take that environment variable over whatever is in the app settings.json file. So that's what we need to do. And we're going to plunk that in here and say that is equal to, and now we need a connection string which looks a little bit like this, except it's not going to connect to localhost, right? This is where things get a little bit complicated. and. And if I was running on a Mac, or perhaps I had a separate Docker image which I spun up which contained my SQL Server, then I would specify the name of that other Docker container, or I would say localhost with a port, or something like that. But I'm running on Windows, and the vast majority of the time I'm running in Visual Studio, and I have my own SQL Server instance. So what I kind of want to do is I want this Docker container to reach out into the host image and connect a SQL Server there. Well, that is uh, a little bit of magic that you can do with a special command in Docker containers. All right, and if you do a little bit of searching on the internet, you're going to end up here probably on the Stack Overflow post that says, how do you get to the host from inside? And the answer is docker.win 
for localhost. And so I'm going to specify that as my server there. And the database is, yes, yeah, still least stored DB. Connection string is true, but I can't use, sorry, tr trusted connection is actually not true because I can't, I'm not in a Windows context. So I need to specify a user ID and password. All right, and then I can specify as a user ID, at least or admin, and the password. Well, don't copy my super secret password there. And with any luck, that'll at least connect up to the database now. What do you think? What are our odds? We're going to do a, I'm going to give it a shot, so clear. We're going to do down. Right, and we can take a look in the hosts this way this time and see if we made any more progress. Keyword not supported server. It looks like I may have messed something up in here. Well, I'll tell you what. I think the syntax of this actually needs to change. I think this needs to be there. Let's try that. That should be better. There is a possibility that this may have actually worked. That's great. It is actually running. That's very good. Oops, 9901 was the one that we were interested in. That's the back end. All right, we have made some progress. Swagger, Swagger is loading. It was able to connect to the database. The problem is it doesn't like our port names. And the, the reason is that the Swagger file has hard coded in it the port name that it should be redirecting to. So we need to override that. And that's an easy thing to do. Before I do that, there's one last thing. If you start running into problems with this, do not forget that if you are running a SQL Server uh, developer edition, that you need to open up TCP ports. And so to do that, you go to computer management, I believe. And this is an important step, real easy to overlook the very first time you set things up. And inside of here, services and applications, SQL Server configuration manager. And then you're interested in the native client configuration protocols. There we go. And then you need to make sure TCP IP is enabled. It's going to be disabled by default. So that's, uh, that's a little gotcha right there. I might as well turn on named pipes while you're at it. OK. So to make this work for the next step, we need to look back inside of our app settings.json file in the web host, yeah, here, and take a look at this. This is wrong. This is saying we want our server root address to be this thing. Well, it's actually 9901, and the client root address should be 9902, and then the core's origins, while we're at it, we should probably fix those as well. So to fix those, we're going to go back into the Docker Compose file. All right, that should be enough to get at least the back end working. We're now overriding those specific variables. They're kind of specific to ASP.NET Boilerplate, although those core's origins is obviously generically important. It's anytime you have your application and a slightly different URL than your back end. Anytime your front end and your back end don't have the same port number, they don't have the same URL name. So that's going to be a problem in this case. All right, hey, look at that. Our back end is up, and it looks like we could actually maybe start querying some things. Let's see if we can get some products out of the database. Let's see if we can get all products. We're going to, actually, I'll probably need to log. Oh, I'm already logged in. It remembered that from some previous session. That's nice. Uh, let's say that I hadn't done that. We're going to authorize it, and we're going to log in as, a, oh, let's just log in as the host and admin, and it's, what, 123QWE? Think is the default. Seems to have worked. And let's see if we can get, oh, I wouldn't expect to get all products to work, but let's just see if we can get anything to work. Hey, it returned a sign of shame mug and a sign of shame. How cool is that? Okay, so our Swagger UI is working. It's executing commands against the back end. Let's see if we can get the front end working. 
we got to be close, right? An error has occurred. And if we go in F12 and take a look inside the developer tools, I think we're going to find that this is going to the wrong backend URL. There it is. It's trying to connect to 21021. And that was a problem that I mentioned earlier on in here when I was taking a look at the the build file, build with ng. And this is saying uh, 21021. We want to replace it with 9901. Well, that's accurate. We did want to replace 21021 with uh, 9901. But the problem is, because this was running with minus minus, uh, it, we did build minus minus prod minus minus AOT, it's not using this particular file. It's not using the app config.json. Instead, there's a separate file that's very similar to that call, called an app config.production.json. So what we should have done is set this to app config.production.json, or maybe just modified that file ourselves. And if I, uh, again, probably don't do this, but I've done it in both places for expediency, I'm going to say this should have been 9902, and this should have been 9901. Is that right? Something like that. And if I refresh this, it's not going, I'm gonna have to rebuild because the, those changes were just in my host machine. Actually, probably ought to change this Docker Compose file and put it in the right place. It actually lives in ASP.NET Core Docker NG. So I'm just gonna replace that whole thing with the one we came up with, and now I'm gonna rebuild. Okay, the build finished. Took a little while, but we're ready to go. Now, we should be able to Well, we still should have a 9901. Excellent. Okay, that was with a complete rebuild. So we're able to reproduce everything with a complete rebuild. That's excellent. 9902. Oh, fantastic. That is great. That is great news. There we are. Okay, everything is running in Docker as we would have expected. So we've gone over in this episode what Docker is. The benefits of it, how uh, what are some of the main terms, and how to get an ASP.NET boilerplate up and running with a Docker Compose file. And we did make a couple changes along the way, but eventually we got this working, and we learned a lot about how things work in the process. So stick with me. I hope that you will, because in the next episodes, I'm going to get into how to deploy this into the cloud. So, all right. Have a good one. I will talk to you later.